Well, I don't have a watch, and I don't know how long I have, so just uh, let me know. Then it's my time, then it's, when it's your time. Uh, I was born in the Netherlands. You can hear my, my accent, and I can't shake it. And I was born in the, uh, in the Hague, and then the, the Germans invaded our country when I was 20. I had just been t turned a week before 20. And they started right away making rules. And I think this is such a Dutch area, but we have one thing a characteristic, and we are very stubborn. <laughs> and so, and Hitler right away started to make rules. We couldn't listen to the BBC, we couldn't listen to this, and that. we thought the heck with Hitler. But they had everywhere the Gestapo, the Geheime Staatspolizei, the secret police. And they were everywhere. And officially they had to wear dark uniforms, black uniforms, but mostly they were just dressed like you and I. And they were from all ages. And if you said anything, for instance, they took 200 of our top politicians as hostage, 200. And they told us, if you do anything we don't like, we shoot them. And in Amsterdam, they did something that they didn't like, and they shot hundreds of them. So we were furious. Anyway, then we started to do whatever we could. And we listened to the BBC was forbidden. And then that, at that time, you didn't have much uh, to spread it. So we typed the news up and spread it. And then slow, slowly, they made more and more rules. So I have here still some papers. Uh, for instance, we all have to have an identification card. If you were 14, you had to have them. And this is an identification card. Like here, when you drive, you have to have your driving license. But what they did is for, you had to go to the German town hall to get it. This is when, and this is enlarged, but the real size was small. I have probably, so. And it had everything, your thumbprint, your picture, your fingerprint, and uh, what you, where you worked. And all the Jewish people had here a fat black J. And they had, you know, the Netherlands is so small. It's smaller than your old island. And then you, everybody was born, had to, the father had to go to the town hall and report that there was a boy or a girl in the name. They had everything in your face that now they don't do that anymore, but at that time they did. So they had at their fingertip, and they had so many Jewish people, because in 15 and 1600, they were all burned and persecuted in, uh, in Spain and in Lisbon and in Lisbon. And they all came to the Netherlands, so we had an immense amount of Jewish people. And then you know that when Hitler became powerful, that and Frank, so many of the German Jews came to the Netherlands. We had so many Jewish people, and we had not been for years and years in wars, so they thought they were safe there. That's what Anne Frank thought too. And then Hitler started spreading out, and then I heard him personally, and I know German, and he was always screaming in the radio, and the evening of May 1940. He had taken Poland, he had taken Czechoslovakia, he had taken Norway, and only Belgium and the Netherlands were not taken. Spain as Franco, and he was pro-Nazi. So the whole Europe was practically. And I heard Hitler through the radio scream. I know that the Dutch are scared. They don't have to be. They were such a peaceful country, never in the war. And I will respect their neutrality. Guess what? When he was saying that they were already marching over our borders. And then we were occupied and we got all idiotic rules. And we don't like rules, <laughs> we are stubborn. So we weren't allowed to listen to the BBC. We had curfew, and normally it was from 8 to 5. But if we had been naughty in the eyes, it was from, normally it was from 11 to 5 in the morning. But if we had been naughty, it was 8 to 5, you couldn't go in the street. Anyway, and then he started on the Jewish people. And nobody knows why he hated the Jews. And then we had so many, so they were all very scared. And I worked in an office with a Jewish guy. He played beautiful violin. And my brother plays in orchestras, cello, and I played at that time horrible piano. But they all came, we had trios. So that Jewish guy was a friend, he was a house friend. 
He made a rule the non-Jewish could not do anything with the Jewish people, not fish it, not do. The Jewish people could not go to swimming pools or whatever, anything, theaters, and they had to wear the yellow star. I have a star here somewhere. Anyway, so this Herman came, his name was Herman. He came, he phoned me and he said, Deed, I may not come to your house anymore. I said, the heck with you, if you want to come, you come. He said, no, I don't dare. This is a star that they had to wear, Jew. It's in Dutch, Jod. So they all had that. And I said, don't wear the star. And uh, he said, we are so scared, we are so scared, what should we do? And I was dating a wonderful guy, his name was Hein Sietzma. And uh, I told him, he said, Herman should not go, because they all had gotten a letter. Herman uh, called me, he said, Diet, I want to show you something. I said, come, he said, I don't dare to. And I said, you may not come to my house either, that was also forbidden. So we met somewhere in the street, and he showed me a letter. And if you think about it, in 15, 1600, all those Jewish people from Spain and Portugal came to the Netherlands, so we had so many. And all in that letter it said, so they had been there for centuries from the Middle Ages, and there were doctors there, brains, doctors, and psychiatrists, and lawyers, and all, they had all good, they believed very much in education, the Jewish people. And, and in that letter it said, they had to leave everything behind, whatever, and they had to be in curfew at the various stations because everything, there were no planes, it was all by train, and they were not allowed to take anything along except for everybody, a suitcase with a change of clothing, a blanket, a cup, a fork, a cup, a fork, a knife, and nothing else. So they had to leave everything behind. And if you think about it, that somebody would say that to you. I mean, how many families don't have heirlooms and whatever things that you are precious? And, and cat, kids had cats and dogs, and it was horrible. Anyway, so Herman called me. I said, Herman, don't go. He said, but what can we do? So that evening I saw my fiancé, and his father was the, uh, the principal of a school in a farming community, if you know the Netherlands, in Gelderland. And everybody knew, he, had, he was the oldest of 10 kids, and everybody knew Hein and his father, and all the farmers sent their kids to that school. And Hein says to me, you know what? If I go and to one of the farmers there, they all know it and said, can you take Herman for the duration of the war? And we thought it would be maybe a year, and uh, then he can come back. And I told Herman, he said, yeah, that sounds great. He says, and uh, my sister is so afraid, Ada. And he says, Rosa and my girlfriend. Anyway, he hopped on the train, this was all in the hay, and he asked the farmer, he said, sure, send them, no problem, no problem. So within two weeks, we had a list of over 60 Jewish people who asked to be hidden. And we found a place for all. And that was the wonderful thing. They were always Christian families. So every day they heard that there was reading from the Bible and so on. And you know, I'll tell you that in the end, we helped over 200 and only one accepted Jesus. They are the most difficult to bring. Jewish people to bring to faith. Anyway, so we hit so many people. But then the Germans, they had no, they were occupying whole Europe. So in Germany itself, there were no farmers. They were working. The young women had to go in the army. They had only very old people and very young people. So the, in all the occupied countries, the men between 16 and 45 had to go for forced labor to Germany. Now, our guys didn't want to work in Germany to make the Germans free to occupy, so most of the men went in hiding. It was such a ridiculous time. I mean, you know, the Gestapo was everywhere, the secret police. So if a man walked in the street, halt, show me your papers. And you had to show this paper. And if you were in that age group that you should be in Germany, you were sent to a real open place. So then it was really difficult because we were hiding so many, but you only, there was so little food and everything was on the ration cards. And this is a ration card. 
And on, if you had such a coupon, then once a week, it was not even for a normal guy enough for two weeks, but it last, had to last a month. And that was, you could only get those if you showed your ID, and the ID from the Jewish people had the J. So in other words, then they were arrested that the Jewish people didn't get food anymore. And that made it so difficult because we had, we had so many Jews. We had not only on farms there's always food, but we had also been hiding them in cities and in places who, who were willing to take them. And they said, yeah, but we don't even have enough food. There's those coupons from our own family. We have only, it was only about for two weeks. What can we do? We, we would take a Jew, but we can't feed them. We haven't got enough food. So then we got together. And we went on our knees and we prayed and we said, Lord, these are your people and they are so persecuted and we have to help them and will you give a solution? <laughs> and then after we got up from our knees, it became really only clear to us we had to do robberies on the German offices. And there is now a book that in, in German and it is God bless our robbery. <laughs> It's kind of funny that it's all the robberies that are happening. I don't think they pray beforehand. But anyway, so then we started that. But then the, the, those attacks on the German offices, that was terrible. And we needed weapons, revolvers, because, you know, it was very dangerous. And you were shot. If you had a weapon, you were right away shot. You didn't even get a trial. So then England dropped uh, revolvers. And it was also, it was such a tense time, because normally your planes, let's face it, they go low, but everywhere was anti-aircraft, so it was with the secret senders that it was sent to England. We'll come with weapons and we'll drop them there and there and there. And it was often in the curfew hour, so the guys had to stand there and always at night, and then those planes came over, and in an open spot in the woods, a big, big drums with, uh, with weapons. So we had weapons, but on having, on having them, that was, you were also shot. Anyway, it became a horrible time. I mean, that every month we needed to do a robbery. So then we <coughs> found places that the Dutch people, the Germans, did not want that the offices were left because most people didn't want to work for them. But the food supply, they said, you have to work, oh, thank you. You have to work there, and you have to, uh, to be there. So then we, I remember that it was, we picked every month an office where we had a friend. And then we said, make a drawing, and exactly where all those ration cards, they, they were monthly. So we had to do it two or three days before the new cards came out. And then we had a drawing where to go, and sometimes there was always, of course, a guard. Then we tied up the guard like that. He, but they were mostly on our side because they told us where the where the papers were. But it was very dangerous. And then that worked okay. We hit more and more people. And at one point, I had one address, and it was in the Hague. And they said, "Hein, my fiance was the leader of our group." He says, "Did will you go to that and that address?" and it's in the heart of town on the second floor, and it's very dangerous, and you, they won't open the door unless that you know the password, and they give you the password. So I was a bit scared, and I rang the bell, and it was on the second floor, like I say, and underneath was a food store, and when I had set the password, they let me in. Now, I told you we had one person at this farm, maybe a couple at another farm, and this was in the heart of the Hague on the second floor. And I come in there. It was an apartment for one person, a bedroom, a, a, a sitting room, a small kitchenette, a toilet, and a hall. And that woman, her name was Mies. And she did not see the danger, but she had a golden heart. She had in those three rooms 27 Jews. And I couldn't believe it. I said, how do you do that? She said, well, and there was a thing on the wall where all mattresses and, she had to throw, and in the night we spread over the floor and we sleep all there. She had a pregnant woman. She had an old man who actually died there. And then 
in the middle of the Hague with every Bergestapo, how do you get that guy berries? And it was, we, we, and we were all only in our early 20s. We had some unsurmountable problems, but God always helped. And then, uh, because there was no food anymore, if a person had, let's say, a beautiful crystal thing from that they got married, which you never use, they changed that for a bag of potatoes. So everybody went to the farms and tried to exchange precious things with the farmers. So what we did is that dead man, we rolled him in a carpet, and then we carried him out, and they thought, oh, this is changing her carpet for a bag of potatoes after the war, because the Jewish people want to be buried in Jewish uh, cemeteries. So he was reburied there. But it was impossible. Anyway, at Nice, she didn't see the danger. And uh, I said, Nice, because I, while I was in her apartment, I heard the neighbors talk, so it was not very well insulated. I said, do you hear that? Yeah. I said, here you have 27 years, this all the time. And the toilet was going all the time. And you could hear that. I said, you have to make regulations that for pee, that they may not flush because, you know, otherwise the neighbors think, well, the whole day she's flushing her toilet, 27 people. It was terrible. And I got them all IDs without a J. And then I took them little by little away. I had to find places, and it was already several years in the war, so who was willing to have a Jew had already one, and the others often didn't dare to. Anyway, I had to cut her down from 27 to 9, and then I come back, and she had six new ones. And I, yeah, and she says, I can't say no. I said, but the others are in danger, you have to think. And there was, and then in the meantime, what the Germans did, did the, the biggest thing in money was a 500 guilder thing. And all those Jews had to put them in, in guilders, you know, they you don't take one like dollars. Anyway, so they had guilders. And then they made the rule, all the 500 are worthless. And they had to go to, if my father had a business with all the 500 guilders, he had to go to a bank and get smaller. But the Jewish people couldn't do that. We had one problem after another. And then the Jews wanted to get out, can we come one, one day out just to get that money changed? But they looked so Jewish. We said, you can't, we have to do it for you. Anyway, at one point, uh, I told me, you are doing so dangerous. And she spoke a bit like Indonesian staccato. She said, I feel so sorry for those people. And on Saturday night, I set the record on and they made dance. I said, did you do that when you lived here alone? I said, don't the neighbors hear that you are so, you do so dangerous. Anyway, I'd warned her many times and I, she wanted to know my name. I said, call me Toast. I said, you will be arrested. I don't want that you know who I am. Yeah, but if I need you, I said, I get up early, and before I go to my work, I have two hours. If you need me, you can, uh, I come, I'll phone you, and if you need me, then I come. And I have an hour lunchtime. I call you an hour before lunchtime if you need me. And I called two hours before the curfew. So I was there five, six times a week. So many things. Anyway, so much happened. And then one day, but I thought she took all the new ones in. And I phoned her again in the morning. And I told her, you are the only one who won't answer the phone. No men, no Jewish people, no you. And the man answered. And I thought, for goodness sake, she doesn't listen. And she, so I hung up. A few hours later, I call a man answers. The whole day, a man answers. I thought, oh God, this is wrong. So I went to that food store on the main floor, and they were all talking, yeah, and they were over, uh, how you call it, prison wagons, and soldiers with machine guns, and they were all taken away. So they were all arrested, and I was afraid because she had been so. I was disobedient, and she didn't see the danger, so I disappeared for nine days that I st slept outside the Hague, and I was very careful to go to work. Nothing happened, so I went back home. And then one day, my brother had false papers that he was in the food supply, 
and he calls me, he said, Dieter, there were two guys here, and they couldn't speak Dutch, and they said that they were Jewish, and if I could find it, now that's not how it works. So it was the Gestapo, and they were waiting for me. And I had, in the meantime, done so many more things, and they knew so much, but later it turned out that Mies had kept a diary. So every time it said, those came, bought 27 ration cards. Where did the ration cards from? Clearly from a robbery. So then they were after me for two years. And then in the meantime, you wonderful Americans, you came. And in the meantime, in, uh, the Germans were bomb bombing London and the Blitzkrieg. And then when America joined, we had hope again. We had no hope. I am so grateful to America. And then it was returned. You had a big base in England and you dropped your bombs on Germany. And then they got back what they were doing to others. And but sometimes the whole coast was full of anti-aircraft. And then when the, you guys came over, flying over, they were shot down. And sometimes they were killed and sometimes they hid in haystacks. And it said everywhere, if you help such a shot down pilot, you don't even get a trial, you will be shot on the spot. And then we, I knew all those farmers, and those guys were hiding in the haystacks, and the farmers were all good. So then if the farmer he went to, the mil to milk the cows at 4.35 in the morning, that was in the fields, then they pssst, pssst, and then they, but the farmers knew the underground. So when we helped those guys, they had beautiful leather shoes. There was no shoes in the lens anymore. They had uniforms. And of course, then we gave them, it, it, but there was hardly any clothing. So then we gave those pilots old clothes and old shoes and false papers. But they couldn't speak. If they were stopped, they couldn't speak Dutch, you know, so that was difficult. So then we helped those and we brought them to a certain point. I always had to bring them to a farm and I didn't tell after the war not know what would happen further. But one time uh, we, we had four pilots shot down and they, my fiancé was there and he says, uh, they asked, what is your name? No, you never gave you. So he said, Pete. And a moment later his brother came in and the brother looked so much like Heinrich Liebert a year and a day. And they said, they're those pilots said, oh, and that is a repeat. So Pete and repeat. And we listened, of course, to the radio. And the phone was a few weeks later, we heard uh, many regards to Pete and repeat. So we knew that they had safely arrived in England. I, I always tried to go to Lisbon. And there came under uh, submarines or planes, and they took them to England. So that is wonderful. And as a matter of fact, Many of those pilots, they gave their name, and I haven't, I, I'm so proud of that. That's the really thing I'm proud of. I have a personal signed thing from Eisenhower thanking me for helping those pilots escape. Now that is something. <coughs> anyway, then uh, so many things happened. Mies was arrested, I went in hiding. And then later, and Hein was in hiding because he was stopped in the train. The train, they stopped and he had false papers. But there was one thing, the Gestapo was smart. And it was just like a chess game between the Gestapo and the resistance. Because, like I told you, this thing was printed. We all got it in 42. And then everybody, we had 9 million inhabitants. If you were 14 and over, you had to have this that small thing here somewhere. Anyway, but in 43 they ran out, and here in deep purple, there was your nationality, nationality Dutch here. And here you can maybe, it's very pale now. And in 43, when they were out of those, they printed exactly the same, but in black, that those two little words, national, and deep purple, and. And black, you hardly see the difference, but they knew it. And then I, they were after me, so I got a new ID. And 
I was originally getting, had gotten it in 41. So on the new, I, they said I, uh, that I had gotten it in 41. <laughs> and this was one of the new ones from the last robbery. And on that, I was arrested. And I didn't know why. I was sitting in the train and they did control. They always control train. So, and the, the girls, the, the men were always stopped. So the girls had all the, I had loads of dangerous papers here in my blouse. And uh, I sat in the train and I had to bring them somewhere because one of the guys was in danger and he had been arrested. So they said, Deed, you can travel. Warn all the guys not to use the P.O. box anymore. So I had done everything, but I'd gotten all the dangerous stuff from the guys and I had to leave my blouse and I sit in the train and there is train control. And I had one of the new ones because they were after me. And like I say, I got this in 43 or 44, and the prison, and they had done that it was expired, that I, it was from the 40, 41 print. Anyway, they stopped and they looked and they started laughing. And there were five Gestapo guys and they said, out of the train. So I stood there and I had all this stuff here. And God is so good, you won't believe it. I never forget it. It was May 8, 2 in the afternoon. And I stood there, and I had, this is my sure death sentence. And the five guys stood there, and just then, plastic had been discovered. That was the first time. And one of those Gestapo guys, a very tall guy, he had one of those shiny raincoats, gray. And I hear, and I pretended that I couldn't speak German. I did it the whole war, so I heard many of things that they discussed my case in my front, in front of me. And I hear them say, "Is that that new material? What nice! And what the nice big pockets!" And then, but at that time, you only had gabardine coats, and in each side pocket. And this guy says, no, he says, this is so nice. He says, and you know what? It has pockets on the inside. Now, now we have pockets even on our sleeves, but that was then very new. And he said, on the inside, and he was one of the tallest, and God is so good. He opened his coat wide, and they were all five, not looking that moment at me. And I threw it away, that God gave me that chance. It saved my life. And, you know, just that made me so confident that God was there and that he would take care of me. Anyway, I was brought to a big prison, and it was a small cell, and this brick was there. It was a maximum security, and the, they took everything away, and I got a prison dress, and the only thing they, let, they did not take was a, a little bobby pin here. And then I came in a cell, and I was number five in a one-person cell. <laughs> and I, anyway, there was one old lady, Jewish, and there was a small cot, so she had me slept on straw on the floor. And then I had to go bathroom, and I said, where do you go? Do you, that they take you at certain times out? And they smiled, and in the corner there was a big drum. And four or five people in that cell, and we had to do everything in the door. <laughs> it was horrible when I now look back. You don't hear me complain ever, because it can never be as bad. Anyway, so that was it. Uh, and then uh, every Tuesday and Thursday night was horrible, because that is when they did the raids on the Jewish people. And then in the middle of the night, you couldn't sleep because then the kids were separated. And they heard, Mama, Mama, Mama. And the poor kids were taken away. And we thought that I saw later a movie that a nurse walked them. So we thought they were, they were brought straight to the gas chamber. And so many horrible things happened. Anyway, I don't know my time might be about up. But I can only say that God was always there. And with my bobby pen, I scraped in the wall when the others were looking through the spy hole that there was no guard. Lo, I am with you always. And you are young people and you are old people. And I would say, there is not one life that from the moment you are born till the day you die, that you don't get the cross to bear. 
and she put, yeah, some people get heavy crosses and some people get many crosses. And you know what? I have had many crosses, but God was always there like he promised. And I think it is so wonderful that you can just trust him. Lo, I am with you always. And whatever happens in your life, remember that. When, when things come or when you have had them and you have lost, uh, from my group of 13 people, eight were killed and several were handicapped and whatever. But God has a purpose and he is in control. And whatever happens, he is there. And for the younger people, I want to say, if you have to make decisions about life, I could have also that we didn't get involved. And many people didn't want to be involved. But if God put things on your path, there are two things. If you have a religion, you have guidelines. If you don't have a religion, you have a little voice here in your heart that tells you what is right and what is wrong. But follow that. And you know what? I also think, if you think of the 12 apostles, only John lived long. And John was the man who wrote the book. So God gave him a long life. But all the others died horrible death. Peter was crucified, head down. James was sawn in two. And I, sometimes God's dearest children get the heaviest load. And then you are a testimony to the world. And I also think, you know, that he saved jo uh, John to write the book, The Wisdom of God, because Mary, the mother of Jesus, lived with John. So she could tell so much to John about Jesus as a child and bigger, and he wrote those beautiful books. And God has a plan for all your lives. And then you got to make choices, make the right choice. And sometimes that brings suffering. But I mean suffering, I mean, I mean in, the, in the New Testament it said, they thanked God that they were worth to suffer for him. So if you have a difficult time, remember that that God often his dearest children gives heavy loads. And I don't know if anybody has a question. Nobody. Nobody. And God is so good because of all my friends, I'm now the only one. I'm not even old, I'm an antique, I'm 92. <laughs> I'm 92, so I think he spared my life to tell the great things he has done. Oh, that is wonderful. That were his chosen people. They were his chosen people. I support always the Jews for Jesus because it's so hard to, go, to bring them to faith. And they are God's elect. They were chosen. Whether they loved him or not, but I always support Jews for Jesus because... They were his chosen.